Hi, I'm John, the MedPod engineer, Termel, and this is part two of a three-part story about how I spent almost six years reporting to government authorities while on bail or on probation for having gone on Parliament Hill in May of 2003 with seven pounds of marijuana to prove that the law was invalid because on the next day they were reintroducing what I considered a new prohibition which I would have had to fight all over again and uh, so the first article was I dare gamble imprisonment and it was my facts to the crown attorneys telling them I was going on the hill that I knew the law was dead they should know it too and I was flaunting and see what they would do and now this part two is when the RCMP show up to take me away and what happens after that and part three will be how the media covered the story finally the RCMP officers arrived and informed me that I was under arrest for possession with the intent to traffic what I'd expected the moment you're caught with more than three keys it is assumed for the purpose of trafficking but this time, even more cameras have come out from Parliament to get the story. You can see the picture of me getting arrested in today's Globe and Mail. I was put in a cruiser, and even more reporters started to show up and try to shout questions through the glass, but couldn't be heard. I could only keep mouthing medpot.net, and then I was driven away. Before exiting the grounds, the lady officer read me my rights, and then we followed the lead car as I was driven to the RCMP detachment at MacArthur Road and the Vanier Parkway. What's interesting is it's right beside Louie's Restaurant that won the best pizza in Ottawa award a few years back, whose owner, Mo, is a poker buddy. So I told the officers that if they called Louie's Pizza and said they had John Turnell in custody, Louie would probably send over a couple of pizzas for us. They didn't, in case he was an accomplice who might try to break me out. So, <laughs> too bad they missed some great pizza, the all-time best. So they searched me, interviewed me, photographed and fingerprinted me, and did the reports. I did have my last joint hidden among some tissues and managed to keep it, but I had no way to light it. They didn't allow smoking anymore, so who needs a light, eh? It's always reassuring to run into the older guys I'd known when I was picketing Parliament in the early days, since most RCMP do get a stint there. The senior officer was no exception, so he had a great time telling the younger guy about the candidate for Ottawa mayor busted in the biggest gaming house raid in Canadian history in their car. They then drove me to the Ottawa police to be kept overnight until my hearing in the morning. This was the part I dreaded. The Ottawa police station holding cells of steel cots, no mattress, no pillow, no blanket. A night on a steel cot is a nightmare. I had tried to think ahead. I have a traveling pillow shaped in a horseshoe to go around my neck on buses in places I'd call the neck brace. It really was going to help my neck and ease the strain. They let me keep it, but when I got to the Ottawa cell block, a young officer who frisked me said I was just trying to bring in a pillow and took it away from me. Ah, just making sure I suffer the most. So that his big accomplishment for the day was making sure the old guy didn't have a pillow. While I was in the first holding cell, I decided I wasn't going to tempt fate during a second search, so I took out my joint and ate it. It paid off. I had to suffer the indignity of being strip searched, and it would have been found if I'd enjoyed if I hadn't enjoyed it 15 minutes earlier. People don't realize that 600,000 Canadians have been put through this kind of degradation since Jean Chrétien and Pierre Trudeau first promised to legalize marijuana in the early 1970s and then reneged. I like to see Jean Chrétien have his ass checked because he likes drinking beer. Another degrading experience is having your cell monitored by camera, which is a real disincentive to have a crap. And I'd arrived after the dinner period, so I got nothing to eat. There's nothing more miserable than sleeping on steel. It's cold, so if I took off my jacket to act as a pillow, my back got chills. And if I wore the jacket, then the head had to stay vertical with no side support. To try to turn on my side meant that my head would tilt at a large angle, and I'd eventually get a neck crick. Or I'd rest my head on my arm and wake up later with a numb arm that had to go through the needles of the blood getting back into the arteries. So it was a pretty miserable 15 hours capped by a breakfast of two cold, damp toast and a glass of juice. The occupants of the other cells were mostly loudmouthed drunks. Disgusting. And when you think that it's the drunks and the liberal party who are going to make my choice, drug of choice, illegal again, the hypocrisy sickens even more.
Then it was time to be taken down to the courthouse. This time, rather than just be handcuffed, they put on leg chains and then manacled me to three other guys. They have these covered vans with a central partition, and on another at cross angles, cutting it into four. They place four prisoners per cell of about space five feet by three, 16 foot in all. It must be murderously hot in the summer. When we reached the Ottawa courthouse, we were all put in a big holding cell. There were actually 14 of us. One guy older than me, another my age, and the other dozen were all kids under 30. Almost half of them there for breaching their previous probations. One guy for being caught with one joint. Remember how the RCMP officers debating me on the CFRA show kept saying they needed the prohibition to protect the youth? Well, here were almost all youth who are on the end victims of their game. So They also mentioned they didn't go around busting marijuana smokers, but usually only the accompanying charge. Here I realized that the marijuana charge led to something else. But having this lousy law in the books, it gives the police another reason to be busting the kids on breaches of probation. Imagine going back to jail for being caught with one joint. That's the reality of it, that the police try to whitewash with it's an accessory charge. Not true. It generates a lot of breach charges. One joint can get some people jailed. So I got to explain to the kids how everyone should have had their criminal records erased when the unconstitutional law died on July 31st, 2001. The court did say it was unconstitutional and no one should be in jail for an unconstitutional charge, but no one has yet bothered trying to get them out. When I explained that I had risked a life sentence to get a superior court judge to order they empty the jails, they became very friendly. One young tough said, you got balls, and I could only joke the biggest. One by one, they were taken up to the courtroom for their case to be processed. Those two who were being released went into another holding cell upon return. After a few hours, I was taken out with two others to go talk with the duty counsel, a young woman named Morrison. She explained that the Crown had already indicated that I was going to be representing myself, but informed me that I was going to be kept in custody until my turn for a bail hearing. She explained that they worried I might go out and do it again. Bad news. Nothing I can do. If the Crown wants to argue I should be kept in jail, I have to stay in jail until the hearing. It's totally at discretion of the Crown, but I asked her to explain that this was a once-in-a-lifetime test case, that they didn't chase and catch me, that I had chased and caught them, and it was silly to think I would breach my probation and be in real trouble if I was released. Since I now had my test case, I certainly was not going to do it again. I guess she must have made a pretty good case because when I was then brought up into the courtroom, she informed me that the Crown had agreed to let me be released upon my own recognizance with a few conditions. Whew, that was close. I might have spent the whole weekend in the pen. I did think the conditions were a mite unreasonable. Uh, no use of substances on the list and no association with anyone who uses marijuana. And by the way, I got that condition overturned because I'm a politician whose natural consistency is marijuana smokers. Constituency is marijuana smokers. And uh, so, I would have gladly accepted the no use of illegal substances so I could argue cannabis in smaller quantities is not illegal. And they would have to prove that it still is. But with the condition against substances on the list, which included marijuana, whether it should be there or not, I will have to resist. And considering that almost all my co-applicants use marijuana, Terry, Mark, Johnny, this is a condition that will have to be challenged at the next opportunity. And like I say, it was successfully challenged. Imagine that, because I'm a politician. So I agreed to the conditions to make sure I got out. But fortunately, I've done motions to change those bail conditions before, and I should have those issues broached by next week. When I got out, I was really disappointed to realize that my gamble had made all news across the country, the CTV national news, the national newspapers, but that my hometown papers had all killed it. Of course, the Sun and the Citizen have been killing stories about me for years, but it's still revealing, and little while not as much, but it's still revealing how a story that they know made the national outlets still gets killed in my own hometown. I guess they don't want me getting any of the toker votes in my upcoming election for mayor. They've always censored any moves that would have brought me support, like media in other towns do not have to censor me. Sad, though, to have the citizens of Ottawa so ill-served by their own media about one of Ottawa's own politicians doing something extraordinary, so the media stinks most everywhere that it counts. At least it's good to know they do. 
Now, what's interesting is the very next day, Justice Rogan in the Windsor case announces his decision that the Terry Parker Day invalidation had taken place. Not because it didn't work, but because the MMAR hadn't been legislated back properly. Now, later on appeal, we're arguing that the law is dead on Terry Parker Day because it didn't work, and the government's appealed the ruling that it was dead on Terry Parker Day because of the legislation problem, and the court struck down the legislation argument saying that it was dead because it wasn't legislated right, but they had to admit it was dead because it didn't work, and that meant that the guy still got off. And that was because we're the ones who made the argument it still didn't work. So the very day after I got out, here's the ruling proves that the possession of marijuana law is invalid, though they charged me with possession for the purpose.